Foundation. Um, thanks for coming up to the research park and grounds on the go today. Uh, we own and operate the research park, and with our partners, the Applied Research Institute, we host uh, the grounds on the go series. Um, before we get started today, I just wanted to make a quick announcement about um, our next our next event, um, which is scheduled for April 11th with James Landers. Uh, James was recently featured in UVA Today, and we have seen an article in the last few days. Um, he's working with UVA engineers and chemists to develop a portable DNA lab that can produce results in 30 to 45 minutes and is making impacts on the battlefield with law enforcement um, and also medicine. So save the date for April 11th. We'll send out some additional information about that after this event. Um, but our speaker today is the Robertson Professor of Media Studies and Director of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia, Siva Vedhanathan. Uh, Siva is the author of several books, including Intellectual Property, A Very Short Introduction, and The Googleization of Everything and Why We Should Worry. Siva directs the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia, which produces a television show, a radio program, several podcasts, and the Virginia Quarterly Review Magazine. He has appeared on The Daily Show, several documentary films, and in 2016, he was portrayed as a character on stage at the Public Theater in New York City in a play called Privacy. <coughs> so uh, without further ado, Siva Vaitanathan. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming out on a gloomy, rainy, cold um, now afternoon um, to talk about something that's also gloomy, uh, and that is um, what Facebook is doing to us, to our daily lives, to our economic lives, to our political lives, and to the state of the world. Um, see, I've given away the the tone and the conclusion at this point. But you probably figured that out. Um, so I use the word scrambles here, and I'm going to be referring to different ways that Facebook scrambles our contexts, our, our sense of stability, uh, because I think that's the dynamic that is at the heart of the effects that Facebook has on our lives. <clears throat> now, Facebook, <laughs> this is a, uh, <clears throat> a sort of a heat map of Facebook's usage around the world uh, from 2016. Uh, and so you, could, you can see um, the highly lit up areas uh, are many of the areas one would expect. Uh, they tend to be in uh, denser areas of denser population, that makes sense, but also wealthier areas, that makes sense as well. Um, what you may also notice is that there's not a lot of heat coming from uh, areas that are in Russia outside of the big cities um, and no heat in the People's Republic of China. Um, Facebook is blocked in China uh, and I'll get into that phenomenon in a while. But keep that in mind because when we think about what Facebook as a company wants to do in the world, uh, the effect it wants to have, how Facebook looks at the next 30, 40, 50 years, the fact that everything is dark in the largest country in the world, in the largest market in the world, in a market that is increasingly important for advertising, which is how Facebook makes its money. Um, that is what keeps everyone at Facebook up at night. Um, now, in the, in the absence of China, Facebook is trying to do everything it can with the rest of the world. So the areas of growth are, unsurprisingly, Indonesia, the Philippines, India, uh, Turkey, North Africa, and South Africa. Those are the major areas of growth. Um, they, uh, some time ago, uh, established a pretty good level of penetration in Brazil, um, the largest and most uh, important economy in South America. Um, Brazil has actually been sort of social media savvy, a heavy leader in the adoption of social media for more than a decade. Uh, and Brazil made a switch, the, most of the people in Brazil made a switch from Orkut, which was a Google-supported, Google-sponsored social media service that very few people outside of Brazil and India ever heard about, um, to Facebook. About five years ago, Facebook took over from Orkut as the, uh, as the most popular social media service 
in both India and Brazil, uh, and it hasn't looked back. Um, so this is what social media um, usage, well, this is what Facebook usage looks like uh, starting in 08, um, and then <laughs> what it is in 2017. Basically, it took until about 2011 or 2012, the early 2012, for Facebook to reach its one billionth user. It only took five more years. So 2004 to 2012, eight years, to reach one billion. It only took five more years to reach two billion. The rate of growth has not slowed. In fact, it has increased. Um, uh, and at this point, by the end of 2017, uh, Facebook had exceeded 2 billion users. The number I've been using is 2.2 billion. Um, my book, which will come out in September, by the time it comes out, I might have to say 2.5 billion. That's a pretty stunning number, and, and I think that's an, another thing I would like you to keep in mind as we discuss Facebook. Anything that Facebook does, any change it makes internally, any way it presents itself to the world, has to cope with that number has to cope with the fact that 2.2 billion accounts, and most of them are actual real people, even if they're not always the people who pretend to be the people on the, or they're not always the same people as, as the name on the account. They're still people. Um, that's the number of people who use Facebook at least once a month, right? So that, that should um, sort of, uh, guide our judgments about what Facebook can and can't do or should or shouldn't do. Right, here's the, here are the most popular social network services worldwide as of January. So Facebook, as you can see, creeping up on 2.2 billion. Uh, YouTube is next. YouTube is very social in the sense that it, it encourages the sort of social linkage. You can follow people accounts and so forth. When YouTube was created, it wasn't created as a social network. Uh, it was created purely as a video platform, an efficient video platform. Uh, and when Google bought it, it didn't even think of itself as a social network. Um, it sort of became socialized over time through how users used it. Users were creating playlists and, uh, and you know, on their own web pages and blogs. And so Google decided, well, we can have YouTube actually um, do that and have people subscribe to material to the to the YouTube material. So that's how it built out later, kind of an, as an afterthought. And it turns out to be the only way that Google has ever succeeded in social media. Google has failed with multiple attempts at social media, but YouTube almost by accident became its major social media platform. Then comes WhatsApp, then Facebook Messenger, then WeChat, then QQ, then Instagram. And uh, we don't really need to talk about be anything below Instagram. Tumblr's still very important. Um, but of these, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the top seven, WeChat and QQ are the major social media services in the People's Republic of China. So you can sort of take those out of the mix because we're talking about a different domain entirely. China blocks everything else in the top seven. And these two services don't yet have major penetration outside of the People's Republic of China. I would say, though, within the Chinese diaspora, which is growing in both number and importance constantly, WeChat is growing. And, and WeChat is starting to make inroads uh, around the world. So think about that, all right? Take two of those out. Now we're left with the top five, Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, uh, and Instagram and Facebook Messenger. Four of those five are owned by Facebook. So they're essentially the same service. All of the user data, all of the records of the transactions that people uh, uh, commit through these services all get put into the same collection of data, the same profiling collection. These services interact with each other. And Facebook sells ads, places ads using all of these services remarkably effectively. So again, YouTube, an accidental social network service, which by the way is heavily integrated with all of the Facebook services as well. It's quite easy to share YouTube content through Facebook. And a lot of 
YouTube, successful YouTube content is successful because it echoed through the various Facebook products. Um, you might notice Twitter, 330 million users. It also, Twitter is actually largely irrelevant in the world. And we don't often think of it that way because we have a president who <laughs> considers it quite <laughs> relevant in his life. Uh, and, but what happens on Twitter echoes, and that's really its relevance. Um, that there is a certain strata of the world who, that is um, uh, uh, a heavy user of Twitter, um, including celebrities and politicians, journalists. So it has outsized effect despite its 330 million users. And by the way, the user growth in Twitter is minuscule right now. It's just not growing in user growth. It's also losing money, hemorrhaging money like crazy. So it might not even be around in 24 months. Uh, it's difficult to say. Um, but Twitter is also important because what echoes on Twitter often uh, resonates on Facebook and Facebook's other products and vice versa. So if you look at this ecologically, you're talking about a series of almost interconnected systems of distribution. And all of them, almost all of them, are algorithmically driven. So there are certain cues, certain aspects of content that makes some content move faster than other kinds of content. And that's especially true of Facebook and to a lesser degree of Twitter. So that's the, that's the world. But this is why I focus on Facebook as a company, as, an, uh, as a phenomenon in the world. Because nothing comes close. Nothing comes close. Um, mo you know, most people who use Facebook Messenger are also using things like Instagram. Um, almost, well, everybody who uses Facebook Messenger has a Facebook account. Um, it, it's, a, it's a crossover. Um, the interesting thing about WeChat is that WeChat is, if, has anyone used WeChat? All right, Katie, what's it like? Um. It was a few years ago. It was sort of like an earlier version, I would say, of Facebook Messenger. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's what, it's what Facebook Messenger is trying to be now, right? So WeChat, um, if, you, if you spend any time in China, you'll find out that people live their lives through WeChat. They perform everyday services through these little apps that run on WeChat. You can do all your banking through WeChat. You can, you can search for library books in five different libraries in the area and, and check it one out and have it waiting for you. Um, you can schedule medical appointments. You can check your medical records. Now you're saying, what about privacy and security? And I have to remind you, it's the People's Republic of China, <laughs> right? So that subject is a completely different, occurs on a completely different level in China, right? But it is so incredibly convenient. Um, you can make payments. You can walk up to a vending machine with WeChat uh, and, and take care of whatever you need. Um, so people actually do live through WeChat. WeChat is the only application that matters on many mobile devices in the People's Republic of China. And that's a pretty stunning sort of concentration of influence. Um, so QQ is a lot more like Twitter, by the way. It's sort of you know, how you announce to the world about things. Um, so WeChat really performs all of the services that we think of Facebook and YouTube and Messenger and Instagram, plus your banking app folded in. Your, um, uh, 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 an app like um, Netflix folded in. Uh, if you happen to use an app to connect to your library, fold it in. Uh, if you're a student, course management software is attached. I mean, it's really stunning how much goes through this one app. And this one app is Facebook's dream. Facebook is deeply jealous of this. Why? Because WeChat is the operating system of how many people? Almost a billion people's lives right now. The operating system of their lives. This app manages the decisions they make during their day. Facebook is lurching toward that. It wants desperately to be that. That's why if you have Facebook Messenger on your phone now and you open it up, you'll see lots of little apps at the bottom. You'll see a Starbucks app where you can make payments at Starbucks and a number of other companies in there. You might see a Bank of America app in there. They're trying desperately to make Facebook Messenger work for you the same way that WeChat does, because they're afraid that eventually the rest of us are going to catch on and sign up for WeChat and, and drop the Facebook ecosystem. All right, this is what Zuckerberg wants, Mark Zuckerberg wants. 
This was, uh, <clears throat> this was from a, a, a letter he posted in April of 2016. And this is the closest I've found to his sort of most updated mission statement. He made another announcement in early 2017, in the wake of the election, in which he focused even more on this question of community. So it's not his mission, as he explains it, and his company's mission, as, as he explains it, is to foster community. Because in his, his mind, if Facebook can help us build community, strengthen community, it can overcome our sense of fracturedness, our senses, sense of, of division. Right? That is his goal. And he would like to make particular engineering changes to his services to nudge us toward building community. So one of the things that Facebook did in 2017 uh, was um, strengthen the visibility of Facebook groups with a capital G uh, and increase the number of features that Facebook groups could run. Now, um, if you happen to run a Facebook group, you might have noticed they've, you know, they're trying to make your content more visible, uh, attract more people into groups, um, encourage people to interact with each other through groups. Uh, Zuckerberg's idea is like, you know, we used to do this at the Knights of Columbus Hall. We used to do this uh, at the Elks Lodge. Why don't we do it through Facebook groups? So it's his answer to Robert Putnam's bowling alone thesis that, um, that we used to, if, if it's true, um, gather together in real time, in real space uh, as a community. Uh, and we no longer do because we're isolated, we're uh, disaggregated. And so he's trying to nudge Facebook users back toward that. All right, but here's the thing. Facebook groups scramble our social contexts more than they join them. Facebook itself scrambles our social contexts. Think about all of the people who count as Facebook friends with a capital F. Some of them are coworkers. Some of them are actual friends with a small f. Some of them are family members. Some of them are family members you don't really want to hang out with, but you don't want to insult by unfriending them, right? Awkward verb. Um, many of them are just people you know because they know people you know. And you might share some interest with. Some of them went to high school with you. Some of them went to kindergarten with you. Uh, and it, it just takes too much effort to go through your list of friends and call them for the people you actually want to deal with. Uh, so you just let their content flow over you. Now, Facebook is aware of the fact that you like some people more than others. And Facebook measures your frequency of interaction with certain people. Uh, and so Facebook is going to reward those people who, with whom you interact more by placing more of their content or the content they post into your feed than others, um, which is why you start to see you know, if there's, a, if there's a college friend with whom you've had a lot of interactions over sports or over movies or politics, that person's content, including stuff you might not be interested in in terms of subject matter, tends to pop up in your feed more often. That's been the basic thing. And Facebook is measuring what it calls engagement. Engagement comes down to likes, shares, clicks, like actually opening up a a video link that sends you to YouTube, and comments. In recent weeks, Facebook has changed its newsfeed algorithm significantly to favor comments over all other forms of engagement. So now, if there's a post that generates a long string of comments, Facebook considers that a sign of deep engagement and considers that to be a, a, a signal that this is a very important perhaps edifying piece of content that deserves to be shared widely. Right? And so I happened to put up a little offhanded remark about how much I dislike a certain classic Canadian rock band. Uh, and I generated a tremendous number of comments, angry comments from friends of mine who like this band. And uh, they responded with a series of predictable posts 
I responded with a few snarky posts, and it just built from there. Pretty soon I had 200 comments beneath this pretty useless statement. It had nothing to do with the recent Federal Reserve Board's hiking of rates. It had nothing to do with the war in Yemen. It had nothing to do with anything important. Um, and yet it became the most influential of my recent Facebook posts because it generated comments, right? <laughs> so, so that's now what Facebook is emphasizing. Facebook, therefore, really um, scrambles our social context. It's very hard within Facebook to, to do what you do in everyday life, which is you manage what people know about you and how people react to how you think based on the context of how you know them. So there are things that you express to your coworkers that you might not bore your spouse with, or you might share things with your sibling that you might not tell your parents. And of course, this notion of contextual integrity, right? Maintaining these contexts, knowing that clergy and coaches perform different roles in your life, knowing that friends and family perform different roles in your life. That's, that's something we learn to do at about five years old, and we learn it so almost intuitively that that's how we manage ourselves. That's how we behave as, as um, successful social beings. If we didn't, if we scrambled everything, and we said things out of context and inappropriately in all these different contexts, we would lose friends, lose jobs, you know, <laughs> lose relationships with family members pretty quickly. And that's what Facebook forces us to do. By, by putting all of these different people into one pool, by failing to remind you <laughs> that you're in a very unusual context, by making the in ease of interaction so strong, and by pulling you in, right? Because it's, it's almost like a Skinner box. It's conditioning you to go for the low-level reward, the little reminder that you might be funny, that you might be interesting, that you might be controversial, right? Because you're checking back, like, I, I posted that thing about that band. I wonder if people like it. I'm going to check back 50 times a day. Whoa, look at all these comments. Look at all these likes, you know? And then you have feelings, not strong feelings, right? It's not, it's not a powerful effect that you know, makes you think, oh my gosh, I've done something important in life. Uh, and it's not a rush. It's not like falling in love, but it's something little, right? It's like a little food pellet. And we condition ourselves over time to want and need these full food pellets, which is why we keep pulling out our phones at, when we're standing in line, when we're waiting to get on a flight, just for some sort of affirmation. Now, Facebook also scrambles our sense of time, right? So, so this popped up in my feed um, in the fall. Uh, it was a lovely reminder that four years ago, we adopted a gorgeous golden retriever, who is now quite large. Um, but just as cute. Um, and, and this has, and I'm sure you've noticed this on Facebook, right? It has this effect of reminding you that Facebook will remind you of things, right? And this creates a rush of good feelings. When I saw this, I had the like, that full body awe, right? That like, I mean, the endorphins were strong. It was amazing. It was like, this was one of my favorite moments in my life. I felt super great about it. I, I like, you know, and then I, for five minutes, I felt this rush. I was like, what a weird drug. And Facebook knows exactly what it's doing. But here's the thing, Facebook doesn't know what's in this photo. Facebook knows that on the day that I posted this, the first time, it generated tremendous engagement. Lots of comments, as one would imagine, right? Lots of likes, lots of hearts. Lots of shares, like fr fr friends and family were sharing, oh, look at the puppy that you know, this family got. Look how gorgeous this So this was one of the most popular photos that I've ever posted. Again, Facebook doesn't know it's a puppy. Its computers don't have puppy sensing algorithms. They might soon, but right now they don't. But this was a photo with a strong reaction. Imagine, imagine if it were a photo uh, the day a loved one died. And this happens frequently as well. Right? If, I, if I had lost a loved one on this day and had posted a photo of my loved one, I would have had a similar level of engagement and interaction. Lots of comments, lots of likes, some hearts. 
maybe a few shares, right? But really heartfelt reaction. Because it was, that would also be an important moment in my life, and people who care about me would have been reacting. And four years later, Facebook would have reminded me of that horrible day. And that happens. That happens frequently, right? Again, because Facebook's computers don't know this is a puppy or an uncle. It has no way of distinguishing between that as of right now. So that sense of disorientation with the constant reminder that you can get some sort of feeling out of this application on your phone is a pretty powerful drug in terms of its habit-forming capabilities, even, though, even if it's not a powerful drug in terms of its um, effect minute to minute. Its effects on the, our world of commerce is just as profound. Right? Facebook is the most successful advertising platform ever created, with the possible exception of Google. For the past two years, every marginal increase in advertising dollars spent by American corporations, every dollar, like every hundred cents on the dollar has gone to either Facebook or Google. In other words, any growth in advertising is going to Facebook and Google. Facebook and Google are already 40% of the attracting 40% of the advertising revenue in the United States. That's just the United States. And we have a fairly diverse and mature media ecosystem with multiple places one could place ads, multiple fairly su demonstrably successful places one could place ads. You can buy, if you have a small business, you can pay Comcast to put ads on ESPN just for the local market. That's pretty effective. Um, you can still buy an ad in a newspaper. You can still do direct mail. You can do all of these different advertising techniques. But think of the businesses that depend on advertising. Overwhelmingly, our journalistic institutions depend on advertising. They are being starved by this. The fact that they cannot deliver the results to advertisers that Facebook and Google can. Why? Because Facebook and Google know everything about us. <laughs> and they know everything about the people we interact with, and they know everything about the content that we read. They know everything about the videos we watch, the cars we shop for. Direct mail advertisers have long known the cars we've owned because they scrape databases from state car registration um, services, but Facebook and Google know the cars we sh aspire to own, which may actually be a more valuable piece of information. They know about the shoes we aspire to own. And they can target ads so precisely by geography, by interest, by gender, by race, by profession, by educational level, with very little expense to the advertiser. Because Facebook and Google will do all the work for you. So what happens when you buy an ad on Facebook? Well, look, you pick, <laughs> you pick a geographic range for where you want your ad to run. Here are the places this ad will run. The audience is defined as within the United States, within 25 miles of Los Angeles, 25 miles of San Diego, all the way down to 25 miles of uh, Austin, 25 miles of Seattle. Right? So you can tell, like, this, this looks, it's, you know, Chicago, New York, right? They're looking for very urban, fairly educated, probably tech-savvy Facebook users, interested, those who are expressed any sort of interest in advertising, search engines, marketing, pay-per-click, social media optimization. If you've ever expressed any interest in that, this advertisement is aimed at you. If you have a job title of founder, CEO, or co-founder, if you're single, if your age is between 24 and 32, if you're male, and if your primary language is English, right? How many people is this ad reaching? 6,700 people. Out of 270 million Americans, this will only reach 6,700 people, and that's exactly what this company wants. It's not selling Budweiser, right? It's not selling cornflakes. It's not selling bleach. It's selling a very specific service to a very narrow group of people, and it doesn't want to waste any money on an advertisement that might not make a difference, make an impression. And so it very carefully narrows down, and, and Facebook does all this. It gives you a series of questions, right? You, you basically click on the features that you want, and you will watch your audience narrow and get more focused. 
And I've done this. I bought. Um, so you can either straight up buy into the advertising platform, or if you happen to run a page, like I have a, an author page, um, and I have a page for an organization I run. And in both cases, I'm constantly reminded by Facebook that if I want to boost my post, like when um, I announce this talk on my, on my personal page, it just went out to my personal friends. When I shared it to my um, author page and then to my organization page, then I was given prompts by Facebook that I could boost the post and, and that they would guide me through it. And so for a little bit of money, for $25, I could have very carefully attracted 500 people or tried to attract 500 people to this room. Um, uh, and I could have very easily, and in, as I said, inexpensively, picked Charlottesville within 25 miles of Charlottesville, anyone with a master's degree or higher, anyone who's ever expressed any interest in any of the subjects I'm talking about here. Um, I could have chosen people who have certain um, uh, ethnicity, which you can imagine is a problem, right? What if I were renting a house? What if I were searching for an employee? I could exclude all people of a certain gender, all people of a certain religion, all people of a certain ethnicity, and people do that, right? Advertisers do that using the Facebook platform. This is so powerful. This is the only way you will ever want to advertise, I promise you, right? And increasingly, it's going to be the only way we can advertise. This is the dream every advertiser's ever had. Advertising was a leap of faith for almost two centuries. It is no longer a leap of faith. This is so powerful. So you can imagine that in the political realm, this is a dream come true as well. And it's one of the reasons that Facebook is managing to scramble our political realm. So when Facebook looked at what um, a certain Russian company called the Internet Research Agency had done, it had purchased a number of ads on Facebook. The same way I purchased ads to, well, I could have purchased ads to advertise for this event, or I have purchased ads for other things. But um, for very little money, $100,000, they were able to test, because you can test out versions of ads and improve them, test and send out 300, I'm sorry, 3,000 political ads and reach, they reached, oh gosh, I've forgotten the number, but many millions of Americans with these ads but not the same ads. If you were in Michigan, you got a different ad than if you were in Florida. If you were in Alabama and you're a woman, you got a different ad than if you're in Alabama and you're a man. They very carefully targeted the ads to particular segments of the American population. And they didn't just buy ads. They also sponsored Facebook accounts that delivered content propaganda, disinformation content, um, what they call, what Facebook calls organically, although I try to resist that term, simply by having like-minded people share it. And they did this through Facebook groups. In fact, they sponsored one group calling for Texas to secede from the nation. That group managed to get a few thousand members because it's so easy to join a crackpot group, despite what Zuckerberg says about trying to build community. By the way, there are more than 100 Facebook groups devoted to proving the Earth is flat. I'm not kidding, right? So this is the kind of stuff they sent out, right? They sent out stuff that purported to support Black Lives Matter because they knew it was a divisive set of images. And many of these images were the, like, the most um, potentially divisive images one could send out, and they tried to get Black Lives Matter um, affiliated or, uh, or affected people to join these groups, again, to spread this issue. Because the louder Black Lives Matter is from the point of view of the Russian government, the more divided American society will be, despite its other virtues or not. Um, and there was a lot of material that was explicitly aimed at promoting President, now President Trump. Um, but there were also elements of this campaign that were devoted to stirring up hatred against immigrants in general. 
uh, and Muslim immigrants and Muslim citizens specifically. This is not the first time Facebook has been used this way. This is not the first time that agents of the Russian government have done this. Americans woke up January 9th, 2016 to this weird awareness that our political culture had been infiltrated to some degree. No one can quantify the effect on voters, but we do know that Russian agents made this attempt. We also know that Russian agents have done this quite pervasively and perhaps more effectively in Estonia for close to a decade. Estonia has been barraged by this kind of propaganda. Um, and uh, it, the goal is to try to urge Russian-speaking citizens of Estonia to become dissatisfied with the Estonian government uh, and launch a separatist campaign. They've done it in Ukraine <laughs> frequently, constantly, and Ukraine is a mess in so many other ways right now, but that's, that's largely been. And then the Russian government, we know, has been sponsoring the same sorts of campaigns just in the past two years, leading up to the elections in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, and they played a big part in the Leave campaign for Brexit. So they have been running these operations co pretty consistently around the world. And again, the Russian government's not the only problem here. The biggest example is Prime Minister Modi in India. Prime Minister Modi represents a nationalist party, a religious nationalist party. <clears throat> he built his career on stirring up Muslim animosity, or animosity toward Muslims. In fact, stirring up violence toward Muslims. He was banned from the United States for more than a decade because of his failure to intervene in what was essentially a pogrom in the state of Gujarat when he was the chief minister of Gujarat. So his propensity toward violent nationalism, or at least accepting it, if not promoting it, is well documented. When he ran for prime minister the first time, he decided that Facebook would be a very valuable tool. And he pretty much ran his campaign on Facebook and on uh, WhatsApp, which is a Facebook product, uh, both of which have tremendous popularity in India. And what he did uh, was he, I can't say he created this model, because this model was sort of simultaneously created among a series of nationalist movements and authoritarian movements around the world. But he hired a number of people to work in essentially troll factories, much like the Internet Research Agency um, in St. Petersburg. Um, so Moody hired hundreds, at some point thousands, of people to post propaganda in support of him and his party and against Muslims and against the Congress Party's chief rival and some of the other regional parties. Now, that's one thing. To flood social networks with propaganda not, is not surprising. But those troll armies also did one other thing that had been uh, sort of a masterful technique um, cre uh, used by dictators in places like Azerbaijan over the past few years. Anytime there was a journalist who wrote something potentially embarrassing or critical of Modi, his party, or the government, anytime there was a human rights activist, an NGO representative who published or said anything, an academic, a historian, any historian who wrote something um, undermining the myth of Aryan supremacy in ancient India, um, that person would be subject to tremendous humiliation and harassment through social network services. They would be accused of all sorts of terrible things, many of which would be sexual in nature. That would generate mobs, threats of violence, beyond social media, like actual like people throwing things at people in the streets. In some cases, assassinations, mob-based assassinations. And this has been standard practice in India for the past four years. As I said, it's been mastered in other places. Uh, perhaps the, the greatest practitioner of this is Rodrigo Duterte, the president of the Philippines, who also ran his presidential campaign almost entirely on Facebook. Not just on Facebook, Duterte was one of the first world leaders to um, sign a contract with Facebook to help him manage his campaign. So Facebook staff went to Manila in 2016 and worked closely with Duterte's staff 
to maximize his use of Facebook. And it's not that Facebook was ideologically committed to murderous vigilante nationalism of the sort Duterte is famous. Facebook also worked for his opponent. This is the basic MO, and it has been since 2014. Facebook has a team of political advisors, and their job is to work closely, in fact, in the same building as major political campaigns to help them learn how to target their message more effectively, regardless of what that message is. Duterte put more money into Facebook than his opponent, leaned on it more heavily than he did with his opponent, and he had already practiced the troll army move when he was mayor before he ran for president. And he basically lives on Facebook. Um, so again, it's Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram in Duterte's case. And it, it accomplishes two goals. One, it constantly promotes his image, whatever he wants his image to be. And this is often what his image is supposed to be, right? The tough guy finally taking care of business. Um, you can see similar laudatory images of dictators around the world promoted on Instagram and Facebook pretty consistently. It's a great tool for that. Uh, so again, Duterte, we've seen uh, almost the same campaign uh, happen in Cambodia in the past year. So all of this was a sort of stronger move than anything the Trump campaign did. And look, when the Trump campaign started, it had no major experienced political operatives working for it. That was a problem. Like its first campaign manager, who has since been indicted, hadn't run a campaign since the 80s, right? So there was no way that they were going to benefit from the professionalism that had um, infused the Mitt Romney campaign, for instance, or even the veterans of the McCain campaign. Like There was just no way any of those people were going to work for McCain, especially before he got the nomination. I'm sorry, work for Trump before he got the nomination. So he had his own corporate uh, promotions people, advertising and marketing people. Uh, and he said, you guys run it. Or actually, his son-in-law said, you guys run it. He told his son-in-law, you run it. Son-in-law said, you guys run it. And they said, OK, well, we're going to do what we would do for any product, what we would do for any Trump casino or winery or anything. right? We're going to buy a huge campaign on Facebook. We're like put, pouring all our money into Facebook. And if you remember, during the, the summer of 2016, there were a lot of articles like, you know, wow, Trump is so cheap. He can't seri be serious about this presidential thing. He's not buying ads. He's not buying ads in swing states. He's not up on TV in all these places. You know, meanwhile, Hillary Clinton was buying ads in Arizona in September. Like, oh, she's up on the air in Arizona. She's up on the air in Utah. Oh my gosh, she may be running the table, right? And we thought that because, because political reporting was focusing on the visible and, and highest expenditure political activity that, that they could see. And it was, you know, that's how you you were taught yourself how to cover political campaigns. Where's the money going? Where, where are people up on TV? Well, again, being thoroughly unprofessional, the Trump people had no idea that that was the way to go. They just knew their own business. And they also knew that Trump was probably not going to end up writing the checks he promised. So, uh, so they ended up pouring money into Facebook and very carefully targeting ads toward certain strata of the voting population. That meant that he could target ads to men of Haitian descent in South Florida, who would be most likely Hillary Clinton voters if they were to vote. But he could remind them, and it didn't even have to say it came from Donald Trump's campaign. It could say for like, it could come from people for a better Haiti. It could, and these ads reminded men of Haitian descent in South Florida only a few thousand, because that's all you need, that President Clinton went down to Haiti after the earthquake, and nothing got better. That's absolutely true. And there's a lot of animosity about that moment. And all of a sudden, these Haitian men, who might have had misgivings about Hillary Clinton for one reason or another, now have a bad association. Maybe they don't go out and vote. If you've hit 2,000 of them with this ad, maybe 500 don't go out and vote who might have otherwise voted. Florida went to Trump by 112,000 votes. So you hit 500 in this community. You hit 500 in another community. 
you dial down the turnout for Clinton just enough. Then you pump up 500 in the suburbs of Tallahassee, in the panhandle. And you do it in enough counties with enough very targeted ads. This person doesn't care about politics at all, except when it comes to gun rights. This person doesn't care about politics at all, but this person really hates immigration, right? Let's focus just on that, just enough to get someone who might not have voted in the last two elections to vote. Really surgical, and again, incredibly inexpensive. Incredibly inexpensive, and it worked. Now, Facebook is committed to bringing the world together. It's committed to building community. By the way, Facebook employees worked very closely with the Trump campaign and the Clinton campaign on their Facebook strategies, but the Clinton campaign basically ignored Facebook's advice on much of this. They had their own databases, they had their own targeting system, they had inherited a lot of experts from the Obama campaign, a lot of data from the Democratic National Committee, they thought they had it taken care of. So they didn't listen to the Facebook guys the way that the, the, the Trump campaign did. Um, not the only explanation, but a factor among hundreds of others. In India, in 2014, Mark Zuckerberg made a big announcement that he wanted to bring the internet to poor people in India. He wanted to introduce a service called Free Basics. And this service was going to give high-speed data to people who couldn't otherwise afford high-speed data plans. Now, what they would get is not the full panoply of applications and access to the internet that you and I have on our mobile phones in this country because you and I pay up front for service plan with, uh, or maybe after the month, for service plan with a major company, right? But very poor people in most of the world can't do that. They buy their data and their, and their minutes and their text messages up front. Um, they go to the store, they bring what cash they have, they buy what they can, and by the end of the month, most of their minutes and data are gone. And so Zuckerberg's been working with data, uh, high-speed data providers, telecom providers around the world in developing countries to cut deals, basically saying, um, if, they, if your users use this service called Free Basics, this one application called Free Basics, <coughs> don't count it against their data plans. So even when they run out of data, this still works. All right? And we will subsidize that. So this is a very egalitarian plan from Zuckerberg's point of view. And he ran these ads in India, a first step toward digital equality, free basics by Facebook, support digital equality. These, these billboards were in every city in India, in multiple languages, um, basically saying, don't worry, poor people of the world, big rich American company is here to save you, as if they haven't heard that already, uh, at least once in the last century. Um, this is what the Free Basics app looks like. It gives you access to weather, access to sports, access to information on baby care, uh, the BBC, the Bing search engine, great. Um, but of course, it gives you access to Facebook and WhatsApp as well. And the idea is to capture the next billion people who might not be able to afford the sort of service you and I afford into the Facebook ecosystem. Well, that's an ancillary result, but the real goal here is to bring information to people who might not otherwise have access to information. Uh, it turned out that this campaign didn't go over too well in India. Uh, India is technologically nationalistic. It has a huge tech sector that doesn't like the idea of a big American company coming in and moving in on this potential market where they might be able to build their own in certain areas. Um, India is also heavily committed to network neutrality, and this was a straight-up violation of network neutrality that I can explain later. Um, so uh, the uh, Indian regulators, under public pressure, actually rejected the Free Basics plan. But Free Basics has been a powerful phenomenon in more than 40 countries around the world, including, and this is not accidental, the Philippines and Cambodia and Myanmar. In Myanmar, there was no electronic media system until mobile phones showed up in 2014 and Free Basics showed up in 2015. Maybe coincidentally, in 2016, one of the most frightening genocides 
we've seen in some time has been occurring as Buddhist nationalists have been riling up anti-Muslim, anti-Rohingya sentiment using WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, and uh, they're using many of the same techniques that other nationalist organizations are using. All right. Zuckerberg's final effort. Remember, I mentioned WeChat. Zuckerberg wants his set of services, his suite of services, to play the role in our lives and everybody's lives that WeChat is currently playing in, for nearly a billion people in China to be the operating system of their lives. So he figures, well, WeChat has a built-in advantage, the fact that China is the biggest country in the world, that people who interact with China tend to use that application. That's a growing number of people. How can he beat them? He can beat them with two tools. One is machine learning, often referred to as artificial intelligence. But he, can, he, can, he has more data about more of the world, and he figures he can afford better engineers, so he can make his services more predictive. But the other is virtual reality. And so uh, in 2014, he bought a company called Oculus Rift. Uh, and he's in the process of rolling out consumer level headsets that cost about $200 um, that will plug you into the Facebook system and offer you virtual reality immersive experiences that, of course, will be completely integrated with Facebook's ability to measure your reactions, your interests, etc. So you will, he hopes, stop playing games on the PlayStation and the Xbox and stop giving Sony and Microsoft all that user data and start playing games using this headset and Facebook-provided software so that he's able to track much more of what we do. Now, this headset is just the beginning. It's the Model T. The idea, and this should sound familiar because Google's been trying the same thing, is to embed some sort of either <clears throat> Um, virtual reality technology or enhanced reality technology in our clothes, on our bodies, in our glasses, maybe our hands, so that as we walk around in our daily life, we don't have to wear these things. We can just wear these things, and we will get signals and interactions, and maybe we could play games when we're just staring off into space. Or we can communicate with each other in a fully immersive way that makes you think you're actually talking to your mother like she's right there. That's the vision. But again, the vision is not just to provide this service. The vision is to be the company that wins the race to be the operating system of our lives. Because he's not only going up against Tencent, which owns WeChat, he's going up against Apple, against Microsoft, against Google, to some degree against Amazon, to control the flow of data through our appliances, our cars, our clothes, and our bodies. And this process is often referred to as the Internet of Things. I think it's a terrible misnomer. Because first of all, it's nothing like the Internet. It's going to be a highly controlled proprietary data system. But more importantly, it's not about things. It's about human beings and human bodies. The idea is to fully monitor and monetize what human bodies do. And there might be ways in which it improves our lives. But the record so far is not so great. What do we do about this? I'm at a loss. I actually don't have an answer. I don't have a response. I don't have a response to even the simpler problems. Every time someone suggests one, I see it fall apart within minutes. So I'm going to leave you with that depressing thought. <laughs> Maybe you have a response or a way out of this. Thank you. Hi. Yes. I have a question for you. So, um, as a Facebook addict, particularly around politics, um, I follow a number of people on Facebook who are much more in the know about politics than I am. And I've started to see posts from them about leaving Facebook altogether. I'd be curious to know your thoughts about what a, does that really solve anything if a bunch of us said we're not going to do that anymore? Um. Yeah, I thought a lot about this. Um, and I take vacations from Facebook all the time, mostly for my own sanity and my otherwise 
um, striking inability to make deadlines. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, I think quitting Facebook is good for individuals. Like, it would actually enhance people's mental health, um, if only for a little while. Now, what you lose is awareness, connectivity, all the reasons you're on Facebook. You would not see my puppy, right? <laughs> that's, and that's, we shouldn't underestimate, like, seeing the puppy in baby pictures. That is probably why most of us got on Facebook in the first place. Because, you know, our high school friends are having babies and buying puppies, and it's time to, like, be aware of what's going on in their lives. Um, it is a remarkably convenient and powerful way to enhance our sociality as long as it doesn't overwhelm and dictate our sociality, which is basically what's happened, right? So used wisely and used for puppies and babies, that's great. But we've lost that, and Zuckerberg knows we've lost that. Why? Because, as Aristotle told us, we are political animals, right? We are not just about cuteness. <laughs> we are not just about things that make us feel good in the moment or, or you know, sweetness and light. We're also deeply concerned with things in the world. We're deeply concerned about power, either exercising it or resisting it. You know, we're deeply concerned with the economy. We're deeply concerned with everything. We're, as full humans, how could we not be? And how could we not use the communicative platform available to us that we know is powerful and effective for spreading messages? And so there was no way to keep politics out of Facebook, but you might be one of those people. I, I have relatives who have said this to me, like, how can I keep all the political stuff off of Facebook? I get the political stuff everywhere else. I just want to see the baby photos. Can you please tell me how to do it? And I tell them you can't do it except that you can pick out like the five people who post the most political stuff, myself included, and just mute those people, right? But you have to know you can do that. Most people don't know you can do that, right? So, so that's one thing. Now, people are quitting Facebook in the United States and Canada in a very small number. In the last quarter, Facebook actually flatlined in terms of its uh, average monthly users in the United States and Canada. It actually went down slightly near the end. That doesn't mean that, fa that's just Facebook, the Facebook product. Instagram use is going up heavily, right? Um, one of the things we're seeing in the United States and Canada is that younger people tend to sign up for Facebook later in life than they did 10 years ago when Facebook was a college thing. And in many cases, the only thing, right? So uh, people are tending to sign up for Facebook well into their 20s, whereas they used to sign up at 14. My daughter, who's 12, has no interest in Facebook. She's already on Snapchat and Instagram. Snapchat this last quarter reported a, a pretty heavy increase in usage and a surge in revenue for the first time. But it's been losing money like crazy. And its usage, it wasn't even on that list. It's so far down um, in terms of its base usage. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a rounding error in terms of Facebook usage. So um, some people are choosing Instagram and Snapchat as the way to do their social thing. After all, Instagram is much more filled with puppies and baby pictures and beautiful pictures and surfing pictures and celebrity stuff, right? There are a lot of things about Instagram that are really attractive. Um, but in terms of how it face affects Facebook, not at all. Facebook doesn't care whether it, if it loses 100 people in California, the next day it got 5,000 people in India. Uh, many of them young, because most of the world where there is population growth is almost by necessity very young. Um, and so Facebook's growth in places with large numbers of young people is pretty astounding. Uh, and that's what Facebook cares about mostly. So uh, it, it really won't make a bit, much of a difference. Now, but Zuckerberg himself wants Facebook to be depoliticized. He regrets the fact that we are political animals. He wishes we were not. And so he made some algorithm changes in December to minimize the visibility of news sites. He concluded, and Facebook research did some studies that backed him up on this, that news was depressing people. Because news is pretty depressing, right? It has that effect. And since he wanted people to be happy when they use Facebook, he wanted to minimize the visibility of news. So it's harder now to see if, if the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal or even Fox News posts a story on their own site, it does not travel like it used to. 
Even if you have liked that site or subscribed to that feed, you're unlikely to see that content unless someone you interact with quite a bit sees that content and shares it. So now he's put the news selection power in the hands of your friends rather than in the hands of the companies producing that material. This has freaked out the news business because they, for five years, have been hiring all these people to produce Facebook-ready content. They've been pandering to Facebook every chance they get. Meanwhile, all the advertisers have been going to Facebook, so they've been feeding the beast that's starving them. Right? It's bizarre what news organizations have been doing, but they didn't have a choice. And now Facebook's saying, yeah, we're going to still take all your advertising, but now you're not going to get any readers or viewers through Facebook very easily unless stuff goes viral, and that only happens for the most extreme content because that's the stuff that generates the likes and clicks and shares. Right? What gets engagement? Stuff that really pushes emotional buttons. And that's going to be the most extreme, over-the-top content rather than a long analysis from the economist about the fate of the center-left party in Italy. You're not going to see that on Facebook ever, even in Italy, because it just doesn't generate emotions, right? The way that something caustic might, like hate speech, right? And the reaction against hate speech, both of which generate a tremendous amount of reaction. Somebody had a hand up in the back? Yeah, hi. Um, so you talked about how Facebook um, scrambles things for us, and I, I've never thought of that, but like this idea of scrambling our communities, um, I love that. I'm so curious, though, if you thought about, or maybe in your book it talks about how Facebook and social media in general have scrambled our own sense of agency or our sense of self-trust, ability to like something without having to go to this place oh, and yeah. see, do other people like this too? Am I out of line? Am I right? I, I feel like I've seen this so much um, recently in my book club. We read a book that was a little... Not, not too old, but I had never heard of it before. And one of the girls said, I really love this book. And then I went to Twitter and read all of these terrible things about it, and I realized I'm not supposed to like this book. And so we had this big conversation about how social media is actually telling us now what it's OK to like, what's not OK to like. And so I feel like it's also scrambling our own self-agency. I, sure, I, sure. I don't know what you think it's, about that. It's, it's like peer pressure in middle school. Right. Right. This is a show we're supposed to like. So by the way, we should say we're Facebook friends, the two of us. So we, <laughs> we could talk about this on Facebook if we wanted to. Um, and neighbors. Um, so yes, that is, I mean, that is one of the things. The, the fact that you can quantify the reaction uh, of, about something, um, you know, you can post something critical. So uh, there was a big magazine article that just got posted that's very controversial. Uh, and I've been posting reactions to it, you know, and I can see what my friends think about what I've posted. Um, and I can see if I'm out of line, right? I can see if I'm like way off on the margins of my friends' opinions. Um, and if I'm not, if I'm getting affirmation, then I'm sort of, without even thinking about it, again, like it's a Skinner box. I'm trained, like the rat in the pellet, to post something else about the same subject next time and like double down on it. But if I were getting a bunch of pushback on it, about a, a book or a magazine article or a movie, um, I might think twice about voicing my opinion. I might not change my opinion, but I will be more demure because the crowd can shout me down, right? Even if they're my friends with a capital F, they could shout me down, and they do. Um, so there is that. It, it is your, the feedback you get is so clear, loud, obvious and quantifiable. It does alter how you present yourself. And that anxiety, again, imagine yourself in middle school, every day worrying about, do I have the right sneakers? Do I have, you know, like, you know, did I wear this on Tuesday? Um, you know, all of that anxiety that we all were so glad to grow beyond, it's all back on Facebook. Every picture we post is, is under scrutiny. Every opinion we we, we voice is under scrutiny. Um, and again, both positively and negatively. Like the positive feedback can be worse than the negative feedback because we can be convinced, as we so often want to be convinced, that we are right and smart, right? And Facebook's great for convincing you that you were right and smart all along, even if you were terribly wrong. 
And Facebook, over time, feeds you more of the things that tell you that you're right and smart. You know? And so you're less likely to even check yourself. And that divides us. That means you're less likely to interact with people who can challenge you or should challenge you. And you're less likely to build up your ability to defend your position in a persuasive way. Right? The things that we want citizens to be able to do. We want citizens to be able to interact with people of different views, and we want them to be able to stand firm in their beliefs and explain in a calm and persuasive and unaggressive way why their position is right. That's the ideal. We know we failed. We've fallen short of the ideal for the entire history of this country, but we still have that ideal, and we keep trying to do better at it every year, every month, every day, and Facebook has undermined so much of that. So Facebook is an incredibly powerful tool for motivation. If you want to start a movement, if you want to get people angry about something, Facebook is the thing. You want to fill a square with protesters, Facebook is great. You want to deliberate about your school board budget? It's a disaster. You want to deliberate about something simpler? It's a disaster. And it's a disaster because of the interface, because of how it's designed visually. Right? The comment section allows for very little actual interaction. It allows for nested reactions to things, which generates a lot of sniping. And if, like I posted the thing about that band, by comment 100, no one was seeing comments 1 through 50, so they don't know that that point has already been made. And if I had commented about something much more significant, it would have been you know, even worse. So it's a terrible place for deliberation. Great for motivation, terrible for deliberation. Yeah. So when it comes to their, you know, Facebook trying to manipulate emotion and things like that, how much do you think personal psychology is kind of playing into it, right. the fact that we as people don't really understand how we work? <laughs> Well, and nor are we likely to, right? Um, but because Facebook um, is designed to react so clearly to our own behaviors, it mimics our behaviors back to us and reinforces our behaviors. So homophily is the term of like gathering together with people you like. The, the term sociologists and psychologists use is homophily. Homophily is the key engine of Facebook, right? You, you end up gathering with people you like. And, and celebrating things you share. And that's one of the reasons why it's so good for motivation, right? So if I have an issue, if the city's doing something I don't like, I can get 50 people right now to call in uh, to some office or write a letter to the newspaper or do something. I mean, right now I can get 50 people to do almost anything loud in this town. And any of you could too. All you have to do is pick the right button, hit the right, you know, hit the right button, pick the right issue, express it in a strong enough way, and Facebook does the work for you. And that's because we like to be riled up, right? That's a feeling we like, even if we don't ultimately like it when we're done with it. Like, we're into it. That passion's really important to us. Um, for the same reason that the passions for expressing love for a cute puppy are strong or a cute baby are strong. You know, all of those things, as long as it's strong, it matters. But again, calm, deliberation, boring stuff, hopeless. But we need the boring stuff, right? We're not just political animals. We're animals who live with the consequences of our decisions. And we could use a little bit more boring in our lives. The constant stimulation is not good for us any more than it is good for caged rats. And that's basically what we're getting at. So we are a grand psychological experiment like we're in B.F. Skinner's lab in the 1960s in Harvard, and, it, and, and we're ending up just as miserable as those rats. Yes? I think your question was leading to, well, self-awareness, can we grow out of this? Oh, OK. I like that. You know, as we learn about how we are and what buttons are mm -hmm. push, can we get better? If 2.2 billion people buy my book, absolutely. <laughs> That's our great hope. No, it, so this is the problem is, is um, <clears throat> I actually don't think we could produce 2.2 billion books, but no one ever has. But um, so here, here's the problem. Like the argument I'm making 
to all of you might be 20% persuasive, might be 80% persuasive, it might change your behavior in some way, that's nothing, right? If I address a crowd like this times 200, that's nothing. If we learn over time that Facebook is unsatisfying, that might help, right? But we, okay, but we still eat junk food, even though we know that it's terrible for us, right? Many of us still smoke cigarettes, even though we know it's terrible for us. So I'm not optimistic about awareness solving the problem. Because the problem is more, just like with tobacco, by the way, the problem is much more acute in poorer parts of the world, where the damage is so much stronger, where other systems of infrastructure and institutions are weaker. Our great hope here in Canada, in Western Europe, is that we have fairly supported, fairly popular institutions that are countervailing forces, like libraries and schools. We have them for a while anyway. I don't know how much longer they're going to last, but we, like, th we still have them, right? We have conversations like this. We have an ability to think through this stuff because we have leisure time. We have literacy. But in parts of the world that don't have those institutions that can help put up defenses, like Myanmar, where the only news of the world comes through Facebook, it's a lot tougher. I'm not optimistic about that. I think we could actually probably build up some healthy resistance. And with political pressure like we've had in the last year, Facebook could you know, matter less in the United States two, three years from now. That'd be fine. But it's just the United States. And one of the things I'm trying to do in my book is get beyond the 2016 election, get beyond the United States. I actually think, I don't think we'll be all right because of the 2016 election. I think we're pretty much in a terrible position because of that. But I do think, in terms of the effect that Facebook's had on us, we have modes of resistance. We have institutions that can alleviate some of the worst damage that Facebook and other social media platforms do to us. Um, but I'm not confident that the Philippines has that, or Indonesia has that, or Cambodia has that. I'm sure India does not. It's a country I know rather well. Um, and even though it has uh, a, a mature and energetic uh, tradition of democracy. It doesn't have um, the deep, embedded, well-funded institutions that can foster resistance to it, especially when the forces, the powerful forces, have learned that Facebook is their friend. That's a big problem, right? Yeah. One image, uh, when you mention uh Skinner, uh, another image that comes to mind that I, that I hear that, that keeps coming to mind is uh, another psychologist experiment, and that is uh, Milgram. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that and that sort of image and how that relates well, with Facebook. So, yeah, uh, Stanley Milgram at, at Yale had you know, ran experiments like um, torture experiments, is the most famous one, right? Where authority prompted people to torture. Turns out, we could get deep into it, but Milgram's torture experiment was not well constructed, and he fudged the evidence, and it probably wouldn't even get published today. But it's never been replicated. Um, but the idea that the voice of authority amplified can push us to do terrible things, we actually have historical evidence of that. We don't need a lab to tell us that. And as we see the um, instruments of democracy wither around the world. I mean, democracy is definitely in retreat in ways that it was not in the 1990s when we thought, hey, game over, right? Democracy wins. Um, for that reason, we really, for historical reasons more than psychological reasons, we should be doing all we can to foster and strengthen the institutions that allow us to think collectively. Because Facebook, among many other things, is undermining our ability to think collectively and think about our problems. So I think we're out of time. Thank you very much.